Twisty. Well, look, it's um, it's it's uh, about a minute after two, so we'll go ahead and get started, and hopefully some others will will come in along the way. Uh, as we'll do at every meeting, we'll start off with a couple announcements. If anybody needs to take a break, it's uh, out the door, down the hall to the right, and there are rest facilities. If we would need to leave the room for any reason whatsoever under any type of situation, we go back out the front door, turn left, walk down the hill to, uh, to the parking lot and gather with the rest of the folks from the Research Council. Um, as you saw when you came in, there's a lot of construction uh, at, the, at the bottom of the hill, so when you're leaving, be sure you turn right and don't turn left. Uh, because they are enforcing that no no left turn uh, there. So that is important. Uh, if you're tuned in on Route29Solutions.org, go to Panels and Meetings, and you'll see some new menu selections. On the left-hand side of the website, look for the Hydraulic Planning Area Advisory Panel, and uh, there's a tab for Documents. And you'll see the agenda for today as well as today's presentation. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and get started with some introductions. Vito. Vito Chetta, architect, builder, developer. Kathy Galvin, Johnson City Councilor and Architect, Urban Designer. Mark Graham, Albemarle County. Alexi Kefuna, City of Shallowsville. Donnie for the Kill, Board of Supervisors, Almar County. Holding down this table for a moment. Our table. Uh, Allison? And John Lynch, VDOT, Culpeper District Engineer. Joel Denuncio, VDOT, Charlottesville, Residency Engineer. Dave Covington, VDOT, Charlottesville, Residency. Debbie Messina, Philip Chiquette, Company. Lou Hatter, VDOT Communications, and pitch hitting for IT. Salmi Center, Kimberly Hall Associates. Uh, Chuck Proctor, Culver District Planning Manager. Chip Royals with the uh, Planning District and MPO. Thank you very much. Um, I expect someone here from uh, DRPT today, but uh, we will we'll see. Uh, Morgan Butler just joined us, and so Kurt, we're still winning. Kurt, we moved you, so you wouldn't have to. <laughs> Sit with your with your neck at a 180. There's oh. more about the joint as well. <laughs> Pardon me. There's more about the joint as well. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Morgan says there's a few more in the parking lot, so we'll we'll go slow for a while. Go ahead, Lou. Um, at uh, at each meeting, we start we started this back in March of 2014 of live streaming these meetings, and we've continued to do that at every panel meeting since. since. Uh, as things go with technology, sometimes there there are mishaps, and uh, we found out that our first meeting, the video did was that our first meeting or was that the last? Other panel meeting. What was the other panel the other meeting? <laughs> At this this meeting went well. <laughs> it was both video uh, and and the audio is posted on on the website. We do keep track. We were keeping track of some other statistics, but quite frankly, they're completely meaningless to almost anybody. The one that matters is the number of unique viewers, just meaning that that's not the same person watching in and out 11 times, but 11, 11 individuals watched your first first meeting. It was interesting back at the very beginning when things were underway with, uh, with the first projects and all the discussion that was going on at that time that number of viewers was, was over 100 a few times. It was, uh, it was pretty intense there for a while. But we will track this at each meeting and just to keep you informed of how many people are, are watching. Chuck, did you and Alan just want to say a quick hello? 
introduce you yourself. Say the parking was an issue today. Oh, so parking's an issue. Uh-oh. All right, all right. We'll have to work on that for you. Sorry about that. I felt like we're no problem. in the Coca-Cola uh, Coca building parking lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, other than go through a round of introductions, you haven't. You haven't missed anything. Um, we told you that we would also keep track of comments that come in, public comments um, that come in either through the website, uh, through a phone call, however they may they may get here. Uh, and there there were a few. There were actually two that we got this. I think it was within 24 hours of the secretary announcing that he was going to be forming a panel. And one comment uh, suggested that we needed to have a signalized pedestrian crossing at hydraulic. And another suggested that any extension of Pillsdale to the south needed to connect to the Route 250, uh, 250 bypass. So we'll keep track of all these comments. The, we'll always review them here publicly. The study team will always always have them and be able to report back to to any conclusion of them. I mean, clearly it's it's too late, too early to say something specific about those first two other than, than no. Uh, one, uh, one person wrote in and wanted to know how the panel members were selected and whether or not the panel members voted. Uh, and as you all know, the secretary asked Chip to coordinate the formation of a, of a panel. This wasn't something that was formed by the secretary's office. We didn't review and approve names. The only thing we told Chuck was, or Chip was, make it 12, and he did, and uh, and that was good. But the panel doesn't vote. I mean, this, there's not formal actions that are going to come come before you. So that response went back to that individual. Uh, we got a comment just reminding us that the, it actually came from the Parks Department that the city's Parks Department is working on a multi-use trail network includes this area around hydraulic and whatever those plans are need to be incorporated into the work that that we do and that certainly will be the case. Uh, I'm sure Sal will be coordinating with those folks and getting their information as well. Um, and then one uh, also referring to lighting and crosswalks wrote to let us know that a pedestrian had been hit on Route 29 northbound. So those are our comments. We'll continue to collect and catalog uh, throughout throughout our throughout our work. We also mentioned that people can go to the website. Lou, if you go to the there we go. There's a if you go to Route29Solutions.org. Up across the top, there's a little tab that's called Provide Input. And that actually came to be through a recommendation of a panel member from the other panel that, well, people might want to send an, uh, a comment in through the inbox, uh, through email, but what about just a running dialogue? If somebody wants to have a running dialogue, that's, then anybody could see. So there's a tab there for that. There's as of this morning, there's 367 comments on it. Obviously, most of those are, are kind of old news now. But uh, we did, uh, I think this was with, just within the last two days, uh, got a comment that, uh, that hydraulic should have always had a higher priority than, than Rio. And this individual suggested uh, that, that he supported a GSI hydraulic. Uh, Another person actually responded to that before before any of us did that uh, and noted that the MPO had prioritized RIO over hydraulic back in earlier plans. And since yesterday, this person has written again and sort of said, yeah, I know that, but hydraulic ought to be a, a priority and something needs to be done at at hydraulic. 
So those comments under that provide input tab are things that anybody can go see any time they would feel like going there and seeing it. I think under the 367, Lou could correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's only one time we had to remove a comment because it crossed the line just a tad bit beyond nasty. And other than maintaining at least a tad bit of decorum, whatever you have to say, you can say it out there. Any questions about that process? I know some folks, understandably so, have suggested that these meetings, the panel meetings, ought to be public opportunities for public comment. And we've just made a decision that we're going to stick with, that we're not going to do that for the panel meetings. You know, when you're in session or when city council's in session, you're there to vote and it's important that there be open comment periods here. We invite the public to watch, we invite the public to listen, we invite the public to use all of these other mechanisms for input that we will review publicly with you, but we won't turn these into public meetings. Yes, sir. I assume the reason we're here is because somebody's determined that this intersection is at a failure level at some point. What does all that mean? Well, you're here, I think, primarily because the MPO, through their deliberations, said that now that you've finished these other projects, or almost finished them, Berkmar and Route 29 widening, part of that long-term plan that's been developed over a lot of years was to also look at hydraulic. And the work of the earlier panel had placed money to do engineering study at hydraulic, but the money didn't kick in until fiscal year 2018. What the MPO asked the secretary was, couldn't we take some of that money, pull it forward, and take a look at hydraulic now, but not just the transportation piece, look at the land use piece. And that's where we're starting. And if the result of the land use piece is to suggest some transportation improvements, let's use this panel process to do that as well. A failing intersection, there's a lot of ways you can describe that, mostly in bureaucratic gobbledygook, other than those of us that look at that every day, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Is one, in simple terms, it's congested, it's taking more than what it could be, congested, it's taking several life cycles to get through. It could be related to safety. If you look at the hot spots for safety on Route 29, at least in this area of the corridor, it kind of radiates out from hydraulic, where the most incidents occur. It's congested in that you have a large at-grade intersection with a lot of lanes that take time to make left turns. The flip side of that is, well, you can fix that in ways that only favor through traffic to the detriment of local traffic and local access, or you can fix it in ways that recognize that you have to balance all of those different desires out, along with pedestrians, bicyclists, all the other methods of mobility. So we're, you know, our phase one is looking at the land use piece, and we're not jumping to the transportation solution until we understand the context of land use. We also want to review at each meeting any feedback that we got at the prior meeting. And from the prior meeting, there's three points we want to look at 
today, and we'll just go over these briefly with you, but Mark asked a question about, well, how is this all coordinated together? How is the land use piece coordinated with comprehensive planning piece in the city and the county, and how does all that work with smart scale? And Chuck is just going to give us a little brief primer on that in a minute. We talked about the area and drawing lines on maps and creating boundaries. We're going to review that as part of agenda item four, because we did make some revisions to that graphic. And then Chuck had gotten, I think, a comment from a citizen that mentioned something to Chuck Rockin about signal coordination on Route 29, and he asked us to review that with you, and Joel is going to do that just here in a minute. So we'll review these three items. But Chuck, why don't you come up and generally run through the planning process as it relates to what this phase one, the land use planning, small area plan, city and county comprehensive plans, and how that relates to smart scale. Okay. Basically, this process is going to look at the land use plan. Currently, the county's comp plan is not up for review until re-adoption until 2020. The city is getting ready to start their review right now, so this will be an integral part of that process. And what we want to try to do is, through that process, we want to try to do that concurrently with these panel meetings so that we can fast track that process as much as possible and so that we can meet the submission date for smart scale for next year if we identify some projects that need to be done. Primarily, what's going to come out of this is a plan for the land development in this area, and then that will dictate, like Philip has said, the transportation needs for this intersection and as well as the area, both from a bike and pedestrian to vehicle transportation transit. And we want this process to actually run concurrently through the county and the city through their planning commissions and their residency meetings and stuff like that, and we'll be available to help coordinate some of those meetings if necessary so that we can streamline this process. Hopefully, at the end, what we're looking to do is have the county and the city actually adopt resolutions supporting any projects that may come out of this so that we can submit the applications next year as part of the smart scale project. But that process can vary in time depending on how much input and how much public participation we want to have with the localities in their process of going through their amendment of their comprehensive plans. But that's basically the process. The smart scale process opens their application period. It looks like right now they're looking at opening it in either February or March next year for start putting the applications together, and then sometime mid-summer to late summer they're looking at closing the application period. So we'll know more once the CTB adopts the changes that they're going to make to the process over there at their meetings later this summer and fall. So it's pretty much a rendition of what we're looking at from a time frame perspective. Anybody have any questions? So I just have just kind of a point of clarification then. So for the city, for example, Alex and I just need to begin to plan when we want to have a community meeting relative to this. We're calling it a small area plan because we already have that language in our comprehensive plan. But then we'll just coordinate with you at the same time to make sure that we'll be okay. That's fine. I know CHIP has met with both the city and the county to try to start this process, and I can coordinate with CHIP on some of the details. We can just make sure that we have all the material that you all need for your meetings, and then we can be there to answer questions and participate as much as you need us to. Because we have to incorporate that into the long-range transportation plan that we have underway right now that, quite frankly, it's not scheduled to be adopted until May of 2019. So we'll do an amendment to the current long-range transportation plan once it's been through the city and county approval. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
yeah, we'll have to get the panel, the policy board to vote on that and make the changes. And it, this could result, depending on the cost of the project, um, this could revolt, result in a, a really large amendment because it's going to actually have to go through adjusting the constrained plan. So uh, we're going to have to shift money around within the plan to actually fund any projects that come out of this. Because right now, the studies set up as a, or the project is set up underneath the uh, grouping for traffic improvements at this intersection. Um, and if we develop a large project, we're going to have to actually move the funding around to make sure that it remains constrained. Right. And I just want to clarify, the reason why that we need to coordinate and get going on our community engagement meetings is because that feedback we get from the community, right. as, well, yes. as well as Kurt, is going to inform this us as representatives on this body. Well, that's, that's why I want to try to yeah. work with you all closely, quickly, yeah. to make sure that we have the information available for you all at your planning commission and your council meetings, board meetings, so that we can get those items those on the agenda on almost every meeting so we can keep that feedback going both ways between what we talk about here and what you got, the comments you guys generate, we can bring back here and incorporate in our uh, evaluation process. Thank you. Okay. I, I do think it's important. I know I have to keep reminding myself of this because quite honestly in, in 45 years, th this, is a, this is a first that I'm aware of where a transportation agency is facilitating a planning process for two localities. Yeah. The, the, the transportation agency at the Commonwealth level is not going to make any decisions about your land use. So, so this phase one, you own. Mm -hmm. you, you, you own. And the result of that might be a transportation improvement that we will move into phase two. Clearly, as we're doing phase one and as you're considering your land use plans, you want to know how transportation relates to that. And that's why we've incorporated transportation not just into Sal's uh, scope of work, but also into the work that Paul Prudeau will be doing with, with VDOT to help measure and evaluate possible transportation solutions that respond to your desire for land use in, in the future. So I think it's real important that we just remember Phase one is owned by the city and the, and the county and the constituencies you represent. Uh, phase two, there will be decision making for, for evaluation and scoring and then whether or not the CTB uh, chooses to, to fund an improvement. But phase one and phase two really can't be separated because the county and the city both had to take their comprehensive plans That's to the right. Commonwealth Transportation yeah, right. Board before we adopt them. So. That's right. Right. That's right. So how does that work uh, from a timeline perspective with the smart scale application? If the application process opens early next year, how long is it open? Or will we be far enough through phase two to get something when, when the smart scale process op opens, a part of that is uh, do does the transportation project that's being proposed in the application, is it endorsed by and does it, does it uh, comply with the locality's mm -hmm. land use plan? I, mean, I can't imagine. Go ahead, Jay. I was just going to say that's why we want to try to make this a concurrent process. Absolutely. So that yeah. we're working on that review of the land use plan concurrently with the development of the transportation project so that we can meet those, deadline, those deadlines. Because basically, if, if uh, the project's not referenced in the comp plan, you can still submit it, but you don't get any. You, you get fewer points in the scoring process. So we want to make sure that we maximize our 
probability of getting funded for the project. Chuck, I would just alter that by one way, one word. We don't want to make sure. You want to make sure. Right. Yes. Because we're not submitting anything. So you would want to make sure, as you're working with the MPO that is made up of city and county representatives and VDOT, that whatever application might come forward is an application that complies with your future land use and your transportation plan. Frankly, logically speaking, I don't think that's going to be difficult at that point in time because if it's not what the city and county want to do, I don't see much success in an application coming forward through the MPO. They do have to be coordinated. The phase one and phase two do overlap, but the result of phase one, you own and that's your land use. Phase two is the transportation piece, and I just don't want us to get confused on the two, especially because we just finished coming out of a process that was all about phase two and one about phase one. One more point of clarification. Yes, sir. Chip, how does the smart scale application fit in with the city's long range transportation plan? Would that have to be, would our proposal have to be factored in and accepted by that transportation plan before the smart scale application? Chuck's probably a better answer. There is some leeway such that you can submit the application, especially if you know, you know, if we've got a year's worth of work here and it's moving positively and the I's haven't been dotted and the T's haven't been crossed for acceptance in the plan, you can still submit the application. Now, it's got to be approved before it's awarded. Right. The bottom line is CTB is going to approve any projects that are selected, and if there's no support in the city's comprehensive plan for the project and it's not endorsed by the city, the CTB is not going to look at that as a negative. This has been identified already as a small area plan in our comprehensive plan, and we can then adopt individual small area plans independent of the overall comprehensive plan update. I just want to make that clear. So we have flexibility built into our system. It won't be, if something doesn't happen the way any of you individually would like it, it won't be because of a bureaucratic process that hung it up. It'll be because there's disagreement on what may or may not be a solution that complies with your plan. So I, frankly, I think on all of those processes that are very important details, they are details, important details, important details that must be followed and make sure we're done right, but there are details nonetheless. I mean, you know, the CTB this year just finished looking at $8 billion worth of requests for $1 billion worth of money. So if they're squabbling in the mix, they're probably not helping you make climb that ladder very, very much. So I think we'll be good on that. We'll have to stay on our toes, keep us on our toes. Mark, certainly the County Planning Commission through Andrew will keep us on our toes with what we need to do in that regard. Can I ask a question, Phil? Yes, sir. Do either the city or the county have a small area plan for this intersection? No, we don't. It's been identified in our concrete as one that needs one. How about the county? Not technically a small area plan, though we did do a comprehensive plan amendment for what we call the super block, which is the hydraulic green bar 29. It doesn't include a lot of the, it doesn't include any of the city, obviously. So 
This is county obviously doesn't have any business talking to the city of New right. Orleans. So you've only got a quarter of it. So we only have a quarter of it. Yeah. Yeah. So what comes out of this panel then in terms of the city to the extent that there is consensus on a small area plan, that only becomes a recommendation to the city. Plan. Well, just as, a, as the strategic investment the area was a, a small area plan that the city had to adopt, and then it became appended to the conference plan, that's what I envision the same thing mm -hmm. has to happen with this. Okay. Same thing. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Does that help? Same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I so mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's just that we have a lot. We have less. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, but yeah. it's an important point in that all that's coming out of this effort is a recommendation for the mm -hmm. city and in the, the county. county. Right. right. But there is an action that has to take place with our respective exactly. jurisdictions. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. To go back. Yeah. To the to the elected body. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The second one was um, the uh, <laughs> the review the boundaries and Sal's going to pick that up in our next agenda item. But I'm going to ask Joel to come up and talk just briefly about signal coordination. This likewise is one where you can get quickly lost in some in some details, but I think Joel has, I know Joel has a good understanding of, of what this means in terms of coordinating and managing the entire quarter and he's going to step through a couple of bullets there. If you get stuck by a red light, Joel, <laughs> Joel denies you. Joel's your guy. That's no, it's, it's Grant's fault. It's Grant's fault. Remember that. It's Grant's fault. He's so, a large uh, man. Yeah. So, uh, in, in a lot of ways. We've gotten a lot of, we've gotten a lot of comments and things about the green band or the green wave on the 29 corridor in the peak hours. Uh, and as you might be aware, it's, it's, it's going to change. It's, it's changed since the opening of the Rio Great Separated Intersection. And it will continue to change as traffic patterns change. Uh, just to go over quick what we've done so far, well, first of all, we basically have been running and will continue to run uh, these, these different time of day plans. We've got a morning peak hour, a midday, an evening peak hour, and then in the off peak hours in general overnight, uh, we let the signals run in free mode, which basically keeps the north and southbound corridor green until you have side street. Uh, calls, cars needing to get out, and then they, they change them. And it's not really, it's, it's not much benefit to uh, running a coordinated system. At that. It's better to change the lights as needed in the off-peak hours. Uh, on the next slide, it just kind of goes over what we've done since uh, opening the RIO GSI. Uh, first, um, the green band uh, basically is the coordination of the traffic signals. And what the green band is intended to do is as vehicles move through the corridor in the peak hour for the most part, so coming southbound in the morning and going northbound in the afternoon, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the signals turn green in sequence. So you won't necessarily see all the signals green at once, but as a platoon of traffic forms and moves southbound in the morning, as it approaches the next signal, that signal will turn green to allow that traffic to keep moving. Now we, we create these platoons and then gaps between the platoons. In the gaps, and each platoon is intended to have pretty much free flow movement. In the gaps, you bring the side street traffic in. They join into either the front or the back of the platoon, depending on where they come in. Uh, that's what the green band doesn't mean you're always going to hit 100% green lights down there, but it means that we're, we've got a well coordinated system when you're hitting those green lights continually as you are going in the peak direction. Uh, we measure that in two ways. One, by travel times. We basically run the corridor ourselves, our traffic engineers, and they measure travel times as they go through the corridor. Uh, the other uh, maybe newer uh, way we have with our performance measures is we can actually analyze each signal in the peak hour and we can give you a percentage, number of vehicles uh, or percentage of vehicles that actually arrive at each signal while it's green. So we know how many signals hit the red lights, how many hit the yellow lights, and how many hit the green lights as they move through that corridor. So we can take that data and we can make adjustments. Yes? Is this all part of NSYNC? Or is it, this is not NSYNC. I heard you guys were moving to something else. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, this is outside of NSYNC. NSYNC, the concept is very similar. We feel we have more analytical control and better uh, control of the corridor to make it work more efficiently by uh, setting up these platoons. In sync would work better in the in the free mode at night possibly than it would in the peak hours most likely. What, what's the new system called? It's called the Automated Traffic Signal Performance me Measures. Ah. 
think that my understanding is the technology has improved over the last few years. So basically, when we started this Route 29 Solutions three years ago, both VDOT and FHWA were promoting the adaptive signal control system, which is the NSYNC system. Since then, both have shifted directions and found that there's better corridor management by using the ATSPM, Automated Signal Technology Performance Measures. I've gotten used to saying it. Does that make sense? Yep. So, you know, even with NSYNC, Alan, you would still look at getting those platoons. It's managed the same way. It's just how you actually analyze it and make changes is what's different. But it should perform in how it's intended. So when we open the GSI, first part of the construction of GSI in the contract was the designer, RK&K, had to go out and count all the traffic at all the intersections after we opened it, come up with a signal timing plan. Once you come up with a signal timing plan, then you do what your offsets are. Your offsets are the time from where you hit the first green light to where you hit the next green light. So if it's 20 seconds, green light, 20 seconds later, the next green light at the next intersection. Those are the offsets. So, one, you have to time the signals. Two, you set the offsets. And that's what makes the corridor work well. So the signal timings were done immediately, and the offsets were done immediately. Then we analyzed it. In October 2016, we made a change to AM peak hour offset. And again, in November 2016, we did the midday and the peak, afternoon peak in January, mid-January 2017. I remember the afternoon peak, I think we observed an 18 percent increase in travel, decrease in travel time through the corridor. More vehicles arriving on green. We are, we found that the AM and PM seem to be working well. And the way we know that is we're seeing around 80, some about mid 80 percent is what we're shooting for to arrival on green in the peak hour. Right now, the midday is not working quite as well. We're around mid 60s right now. We want to get that about 20 percent better. We know we have some work to do in the midday, and we're going to continue to do that. But we feel that the AM and PM is working pretty well. We're in the up around the 80s. I asked Grant why he couldn't get 95 or 100. He just said that's not realistic on my part. But I figured I should ask the question. So yeah, we have more work to do in the midday. Now, some things that we're going to see changing as we go forward. As you have Hillsdale open, as you have Berkmar open, you're going to see some changes in the travel patterns. As you see the third lane, third lane north and southbound on 29, as the construction comes to completion, we're going to have to make more adjustments. Basically, because the offsets that need to be adjusted are based on your travel times, which is based on speed. So as we see the speeds increase through the six lane section up there, because we'll have better flow, we're going to have to adjust those signals offsets so, because the speeds will be higher. One thing that's interesting is the GSI project, when we first set up the system, the speeds were actually lower than we expected through the new intersection. So we actually had the offsets had to be extended to account for that. One, some of the benefits of having a good green band, you can save fuel, obviously, because you continue traffic moving, lower emissions, but also you actually control speeds better through a corridor, so you get closer to your posted speed limit is one of the advantages. And hopefully less speeding people because they realize they just keep hitting every red light. Joe, how far north and how far south is this system? Hydraulic to airport. Okay. But Joel, take a minute, or take a minute, just to talk about what the folks in Stanton do and talk about the coordination with the city on the operation of the signals. And I'm sorry, before you do that, can I just paint on what Chuck just said? My understanding was the discussion way back when about the signals, that while it was going to start at hydraulic, I thought we were pushing it back into the city so that we had flow all the way through. That's why I wanted to ask about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. So we've had, Alex and I had a meeting a few weeks ago. Actually, we've had three meetings with the city, and we're working on an agreement right now where VDOT will actually operate. We currently operate the hydraulic 29 signal, and there had been an agreement that had not been executed yet that VDOT would also put the Angus signal and the Morton signal into our system. We had our technical people and the city's technical people, they all got together and had a meeting and thought that geographically speaking, the best thing to do was not cut 
the operations at the city county line yes but go ahead and figure out what made sense from a traffic perspective so we identified that the signals that hydraulic Angus Morton Hillsdale and hydraulic and the bypass and hydraulic really should all operate in one system and so basically as the city moves forward with their signal project which includes those signals identified plus farther to the south that VDOT will operate those signals that I just mentioned in the performance measures operation so you have the bypass the interchange and 29 north all functioning as one system we thought we could analyze it and then we should operate that as one one entity should operate that and get the best performance out of it so we're working the city right now to do that and the city's making some decisions on how they're going to manage the rest of those signals down there I was going to say Barracks Road yeah that's actually a VDOT signal but we've talked about Barracks Road and we're going to we're going to work all that out but it's all based on good communication between the signals and controller technology and you know we could you know adaptive could be an option or the performance measures could still be an option depending on on how the city wants to perform how how the city wants to pursue it but either way will be I think we're going to see a lot of improvements as we get these agreements going and these systems in place I think the good thing that's come out of that discussion is less don't as Joel said less to less don't let a geographic boundary dictate how we're operating a signal system because the people traveling through there don't care about that they care about that system they call one of us and it doesn't matter they just yeah but that's important so we actually took some of the city staff and the traffic engineer from the city and some of their other folks out to our Stanton operations center there and let them look at the adaptive NSYNC system work right next to the performance measure system and see what the differences are there's a lot of similarities but there's differences on how it's analyzed and operated and so they could start making decisions on how they want to operate their signal so I think and the rest of the scope I can't remember all of them but I think the scope of the other project goes down to 250 Ivy Road and Emmett Street so they're going to be making improvements all through down there and some of the side streets also that's where it was originally the discussions where it started Ivy Road it is still it all the way out the scope has not changed great that's good the approach has changed but not the scope perfect any other questions thank you Joel I kid Joel a lot because I've known him longer than than all these other VDOT folks here but Joel has done a great job of staying on top of this issue of the signal coordination as well as monitoring the operation of this entire corridor as far as incidents go the other panels been very interested in that and that may be something you might want us to review with you as well as at some point it gets back to that first question veto ask actually like well why why are you doing any of this what what's the benefit what's what's the result but Joel thank you thank you thank you I think if we go on into agenda item four and five which Sal is going to review both of those items for us he can speak to the to the boundary matter we discussed at the last time as well as all the email chatter we exchanged among ourselves for the charrette which which will be your first opportunity to really dig in and do and do some work here so Sal thank you I'm certain I was the only one in the room that thought NSYNC was a boy band still learning all the acronyms all right so good afternoon so we we talked I think one of the key talking points that came out last meeting was a discussion about the study area and how we define it and so we have a graphic in the slide here that essentially we 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 went back and said okay how best to do this because we know everyone gets a little nervous about drawing lines once you put the line on the paper you could argue it could be 50 feet to the left or 50 feet to the right how come I'm not included or I'm included but I don't want to be included and so the graphic that you'll see sort of approaches it this way we've got a sort of a study area of influence and essentially I go ahead and put up the yeah I think it's more of your slides yeah okay thank you so the large circle here just represents sort of the study area of influence the study area context and essentially that's an area that that we will be looking at 
in terms of how it influences the key areas, the core areas of development, the areas that we're going to focus in on for land use. But we're not necessarily going to do a land use plan for that entire area. What we're representing is, is this brown area, which if you remember the original red line we had at the last meeting, uh, it generally is, is close to that configuration that you're looking at in the brown area. And that area would be the area we would focus on, on land use patterns. But the broader circle says that if there's something occurring here or here outside of the area that we need to pay attention to, then we're going to reference it and we're going to talk about it in the study. It may be just an issue of connectivity, but it's important enough that we mention it. But in some of these areas, there are existing land use patterns that are not going to change. We're not going to propose that they change. They may be established in you know, residential areas. So we don't want to give the illusion that we're going to go way out there and keep land planning out there. But we do want to reference if there's an influence on land use or on transportation that we need to pay attention to. So at the end of the day, you may see detailed land use map. And maybe there's a, a graphic line out here that references a note about pedestrian or bike connectivity or some type of transportation system connectivity is important we need to deal with it. So does that make sense, at least that part? So, so that's kind of the context area. And then the land use area is where we'll go in in more detail in, in terms of what you think of in a traditional land use plan, talk about the proposed land uses, land uses that maybe stay the same, maybe should be changed. And then this purple area here, if you can see it, Again, it's just that fuzzy core area where we have committed to in our scope to go in and do sort of a conceptual illustrative master plan. And what that'll do, that comes late in the game. Because what we essentially do is go through the process and we're all feeling like we're in a good place in terms of approach and a land use plan and urban form. Then the illustrative says, okay, well, this is what it could look like if we followed all the things that we said we want to do. And at the end of the day, when everything's built out, it won't look exactly like that, but it gives you that sense of, okay, here's what a street network looks like. Here's what the general urban form, how buildings address the street, where open space occurs, where linear green infrastructure could occur. And if we followed all the most you know, high priority items that we come out of the process with, then you could take a snapshot 20 years from now, 25 years from now, and say, okay, it could look like this. Um, and, you know, once it's adopted into a comp plan, it could become sort of a guiding document, too, that says, you know, if you're doing something that veers away from that too, look too far, then we're not keeping in the spirit of, of the plan. So the visual is fuzzy and it's illustrative, but, but there's some meaning, you know, to that. And I think from a regulatory standpoint, uh, enforcement standpoint, it, it can have some teeth, depending on how you characterize it in your, in your plans. Excuse me, what's the radius of that circle? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> Is it like a walking radius, the quarter mile um, or half mile? It wasn't set up that way, but I think when we do the, the illustrative, um, we will refer to, to those types of metrics. Those pedestrian um, sheds. Absolutely. Yes. The outermost area was expanded to pick up some of, from what we showed originally to pick up some of the comments that we had. So obviously it's just, it's a circle, but what we wanted to do is we expanded it to make sure that we had the, the key interchange, the um, uh, some more multifamily over in this uh, uh, southwest quadrant. Um, but again, as we get on the ground and start studying, we're going to, you know, if we need to move something that way or bring it in, we're going to do it. We're not going to just leave something out because it was two blocks outside of the outside of the colored circle. Okay, so that was the conversation in the study area. Does that everybody feel good about that? So I guess just one other question. So again, I know this is conceptual, but I'm seeing that your your quarter mile radius there is kind of straddling over some of the residential developments along Mickey Drive. So I assume that that will include them. It wouldn't, if it's partial, you're not going to just do half of it. It, it would include from the standpoint of, I don't know that we're going to come up here and recommend. I'm just, I'm changing. thinking more like Mickey there, the, the yeah. higher multifamily developments. Right. Can, that are up, can, they're up on the hill. Yeah, I see. Right, right. Um, yeah, again, I think there may be some influences here in terms of connectivity issues. There's certainly view shed issues and things like that. Um, but it's not, I, 
Yeah, we don't want to get into changing. No. We don't expect changing lane use out there because there's no there's no, no place to stop pulling that thread out of the sweater. We just kind of keep going. I'm but just we, saying though that because that circle is crossing over some assisted housing mm -hmm. and public housing, mm -hmm. that's going to be something we in the city have to be very aware of okay. because um, that is something that that can cause some concern if it's viewed that there's going to be a design process going on that doesn't include those communities. Okay. Just okay, well, that's good input. I mean, we, okay. we need to know if there's stakeholders that need to come to the table that we're not thinking of, then, then we definitely want to hear that. And, you know, we can talk with Chip and Alex and myself to make sure we, we nail that right. Okay. Yeah, that, absolutely. And that's really, that's the exact kind of input okay. we need when we want something should be brought in or left out or there's a stakeholder that's not in the room that needs to be here. I think a lot of those issues will start getting a sharper point on them at our next meeting. Okay. With, uh, yeah. Charette. Right, exactly. Good. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, before you leave that, let me just let me just elaborate a little bit on my email that suggested that you extend the area further south. Uh, and I see you've done that with your grain. Mm -hmm. I'm going back 30 years now. When VDOT said that when you consider hydraulic, you also have to consider the bypass interchange mm -hmm. because you can't do one without creating a problem with the other. And my only concern about the way you have that drawn is that while the phase two uh, transportation study may, may, may vary based on the phase one outcome land use plan, if the Phase two, the transportation plan, truly looks at that corridor, which is hydraulic and you have to consider the bypass interchange. It seems to me there ought to be given some thought to the area in green at the bottom there for land use plan also, because any work on the 250-29 bypass interchange is going to change the uses in those areas. And I, I don't know that anything's changed from a up perspective. Uh, yeah, I really would suggest that. There, there'd be more attention paid south of that interchange. And I think it's a fair comment. Again, we'll, you know, there's an iterative process between us and, and, and Baker as well on the transportation side. Again, I don't, this is not to say that this would, we dropped it down a little bit to cover that, but yeah. not to say that we're going to exclude this at all. We'll look at it from a lane's perspective. And if the transportation inputs come back and say you need to pay more attention to that, you know, that we'll respond to that, absolutely. I guess my point is, would not like, I would like not to get to a point where there's a consensus reached on the land development portion, but then you go into the transportation side in phase two, if it waits that long, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the engineers say, well, right. you've got to consider what's going on at that 29, 250 bypass So one of the things we did in our scope, we actually took a pause in our work. We, we got to a certain draft point. We bring in the third party transportation, and then we allowed for another loop at the end to come, come back so that we don't just hand them something and walk away. We get them engaged, and then they come back and give us input. And if their input says, you know, you're really, you're missing this, you need to pay more attention to this, then we can come back for another loop. So, I mean, that's a great point, because we actually talked about that in developing our scope and changed our scope so that we, we knew that we had to reconnect to the phase two transportation part um, after they already got down the road, because they may come back and say, we need to rethink something. Particularly, point out to the city that that's something the city needs to be paying attention to. That is a very important revenue, tax revenue producing quarter. Okay. That's a good point. Well, we were just talking that in a perfect world, there would be another purple circle at the intersection of Barracks and Emmett. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you'd have two nodes, and I don't think there's the scope here. And plus that Barracks and Emmett intersection hasn't been identified as a small area plan in the city's con plan. So this is the one that from a procedural and a policy level will work and I suspect also from a financial level but you know I don't know how to get around that. I agree with you that that area is extremely important. Um, well the cake's getting baked at the Barracks Road. Emmett Street intersection. In terms of the transportation? Well, in terms of land land development, land use. Uh, positively, I would hand, but I'm not sure how that's going to impact the transportation. Right. 
I think the important thing, the important thing that, that ties back to what Chuck was saying is there is, there is the anticipation of and room for in the work for that kind of that back and forth so that we don't, well, let's end phase one and start phase, start phase two. That would be a recipe that probably wouldn't result in a good, in a good cake. So there's room for that. I also think, not to push too much to the next meeting, but the charrette and the public meeting processes mm -hmm. and the, the localities planning commission processes are going to help uh, morph and modify those very blurred line circles as we, as we get Actually, through. in a perfect world, you would also extend it down to the trestle. Massey Road, which is a real bottleneck in the whole. Yeah. It's a place. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the other thing we want to do at each of these meetings is just sort of give you an update of kind of where we've been, where we are, where we're going. And uh, the um, kind of to date, since the last meeting, essentially we're in a ramp up as a, a situation where we're collecting data, uh, we're spending time. Um, driving the site, walking the site, uh, really taking notes, putting base maps together, uh, starting to create the framework for the, uh, for the report and all the exhibits. And, and some of the exhibits, for example, that are going to occur in this report, we, are, we don't even know what they are today because we won't know until we get into the plan. What I try not to do is say this plan is the same as every other plan we've done, so we use the same exhibits. So I would rather do is spend time with you and spend time on the ground and find out what's unique about the area and then create the exhibits in the report that are very specific to what's happening in this area because they're all different in some way. So um, that's sort of the process we're going through now. Um, we've, um, we've collected a lot of data. We're reviewing uh, other studies that have been done, past studies. Um, there's projects in, uh, in planning, in review right now, and some under construction. Uh, that we need to make sure we're familiar with and how they impact the court, kind of the changing character of the study area as we as we sit here today. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, so that's sort of what we're doing today. Uh, we also are, um, yeah, I think we'll cover that. So we're also starting to develop the outline for the charrette. And so I think right now we have targeted April 11th. April the 11th, I can't say work for, it wasn't ideal for 100% of you, but uh, it, it came back good for, I would say, 11 of 12 of you. Uh, so, and and I, I, it, it, of all the days we looked at, April 6th fell out. Right. Uh, I wasn't aware that the schools were out, and that was just really? a loser. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to push it off to the 27th. I think that's not what we want to want to do. Uh, and if we can make April the 11th, which would be our next meeting, if we can make that work, uh, that'll be a, we've suggested a, a, a four hour working session here on the charrette. And uh, Sal can tell you more about that, that process. What are you thinking time-wise? Because time ten to be, one. Oh, that's great. Okay, that works for me. Well, I mean, and, and we have just have. That's up to you. Now. That's up to you all. Though. I just threw that out as. Oh, that's good. It's what it could be. Yeah. We just start early that day, and I just want to make sure that. We're, yeah. Okay. For the county. Yeah. yeah for my purposes, that that's your call completely. I can tailor the the event to the window of time that's best for that you. That sounds good. I thought we needed a good four hours. Mm -hmm. I figure to go longer than four hours, our uh, diminishing returns yeah, might right start to uh, start right to accrue quickly. <laughs> so that'll the, the the idea is that'll be a fairly hands-on event. So I know this community is very familiar with charrettes, and some of those can be you know big and involve a couple hundred people. Um, so with this group here, I'm really going to tailor it to be. Um, some high level discussion, but not a lot of just real fluffy, you know, um, walk out of here, feel good and say, yeah, but then turn around and go, what did we just do? This is going to be a little more targeted to 
the specifics of what you know about the area, what your, you know, your real aspirations are for the area, what are the real existing conditions that are problematic, what are existing conditions that we'd like to hold on to and preserve and enhance. Um, talk a lot about that ultimate form, urban form and, and, and fabric of that area that you would like to see ultimately. Um, talk about you know kind of challenges and opportunities that are kind of real on the ground that we can that we can see today. So there will be a little bit of vision statement too. I, I like doing those, um, and some consultants will do those and then they get lost at the end of the process. You forget you even did one. I always like to go back and back check it. In fact, as we get into the planning process, every time we do a check in on the plan, I like to go back to the vision statement because sometimes that's the most honest you can be. Yeah and make sure that we did what we're saying we're doing. And if we're not, ask why. Maybe there's a good reason why. But if we said bikes and peds are important and we got a plan that's not responding to that, then we need to understand either we changed our mind or no, we didn't accomplish what we said. Um, so I like to put it on the board and keep it there and say, okay, this is our sort of our moral compass. Let's make sure we keep checking in with that. Um, now in the four hour, three or four hour time period, you know, it's been really condensed and, and intense. So, uh, which I think is good because no time for anyone to get drowsy and, and kind of fall off the uh, the edge of there. So it'll, I think, keep everybody engaged. Look, I, I'm fine with it being 12 hours. I mean, I don't <laughs> care about the time. I'm not trying to dictate the time to, the time to you. Uh, so, you know, you all speak up on what you think, what you think works. What's going to be important to me, Sal, is that whatever we agree, we have a schedule and a game plan that says every minute is going to be productive and useful and lead to some uh, some value at the at the end of it. In other words, we can't spend three hours on the vision statement exactly. and an hour on work. And I think you also should review with them what are what tools are in the room. room? What what's it look like that day? So um, we'll have some hands-on um, sort of um, uh, ideation boards. So prioritization. You know, we'll have a list of uh, planning uh, concepts and, and theories specific to this area and, and specific to the kind of things you expect to see in a small area plan. And then have you uh, prioritize those and we'll go through that exercise and sort of as a group there, there won't be consensus. And I would say consensus is never my goal because it just it doesn't happen. Um, what we're trying to do is get uh, informed decision making is kind of the phrase we like to use. Um, so we'll go through some prioritization exercises. We'll do some um, precedent image uh, visual preference exercises. So it's always funny. If you talk to people about density sometimes, you'll hear different different conversations, and, and some people are more afraid of density than other people. And then you might show some images in there, and they go, oh, we love that. And you tell them what the density is, and they go, oh, wow, that's a lot more dense than I really like. But they like the look and the feel. And this gets back to you know some of the ideas behind form-based zoning and those, those concepts. But sometimes you like the look and feel and character of a place, and you're not even sure why, but, and, and you really don't have any idea of, of how dense it might really be. So, so Sal, you're, you're going to bring stuff in. I'm going to have the pictures, pictures and We're not creating everything from correct. a blank, um, blank sheet of paper. That's right. Um, okay. We won't necessarily be, we might draw some big bubbles and, and maybe put some markers in your hands and let you draw on a map for a little while. Um, I'm going to do less talking and more listening, if that means. Um, this is really time for you guys to dialogue and then just to give me input based on local knowledge. So, you know, we have a list of a thousand different things we do in Charest. Again, I'll tailor this to this group and to the time frame we have. Um, but, but you'll get some hands on and, and you'll get to talk to me. I'll do more listening. Will we want to send anything to them in advance? Um, there may be a couple of sort of Questionnaires okay. that we're working on right now. That um, okay. if we decide to use those, we will send them down. Okay. Okay. I, I would like to mention something. Looking at this graph, this is data. And it seems to me you ought to get a drone out there and fly over what's there now, particularly with infection stone field that's yes. still still dry. Mm -hmm. This we, does not give the. We are trying really hard to find up to date aerials. Um, we haven't seen them yet because I know there's a lot. So, um, but it's a good point. What, what's on this right now? We under, obviously there's stuff under construction that's that's done now or near done. So, absolutely. So yeah, if anyone knows that those exist, other than well, well let's just figure out how to get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, one of the that, local firms that has a drone and has to go out there and fly. Mm -hmm. My only comment about the time is that I've just noticed in events that I go to that there's a drop off in productivity after lunchtime. That's all. Be it siesta or blood sugar changes, I don't know what it is. So morning seems to be so maybe go a little earlier and go nine to twelve, be done before lunch, maybe have something to eat there for breakfast mm -hmm. lunch. I don't know. But I think you're right, Kevin. Okay, I, that's, that's my, been my experience. experience. People are fresher in the mornings and it works better. I mm -hmm. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Well, what what do you let, let's let's nail this puppy down. <laughs> While we're, <laughs> while we're here. Yeah, let's start early. I'd rather start yeah. early. I mean, I think I, I, I mean, but I don't. So, don't so else you need four hours, and you go eight thirty to twelve thirty. Do we want to stick with four hours? I think four is going to be no four. more than four. Yeah, not more. Yeah, not more. Less. This worries me a little bit. Worry, I don't even know why. But, but four. Eight thirty to twelve thirty. Yeah. So you have kind of breakfast type. Does that foods? work for? And we'll have some little nibbly. Yeah. Is that okay? But it's less expensive and. Yeah, I think that's think better actually. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's preferable for me. Yeah. yeah. Hearing no objections, 8.30 to 12.30, April the 11th. Yeah. No, no, no. You just come here for your work. This is the start of the day here. Well, let me, let me just say, Al, if you can't find anybody to do that, you've got our email address. You email me, or we'll find somebody to fly for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, and we've got some several folks that have contacted us as, as well. I just can't remember. I can't remember the names at the, at the moment. But we'll... we'll is there a way we'll figure to, that out. Is there a way to confirm this room before we get out of here? Just I'll take care of them. Okay. <laughs> I'll take care of them. They've been extremely cooperative. Yes, so, yeah. And there again, the pu public is invited mm -hmm. to, to the extent that there are seats in the room, because each backside in a seat gets us to the limit that the fire marshal allows in this room. Uh, so I'd love to see us fill all the seats, but we're not going to be able to have more than the seats. <laughs> so 8.30, 12.30, April the 11th, here. Sounds good. All right. So again, we'll, we'll touch base at each of these let, meetings. Let me just say something about this. This is something you're going to see at every meeting because it's good for us. Okay. It's good for you, it's but it's great. good for us. There are things to do. Had them set a deadline for everything, not everything, but all the key steps that they need to do. And this has served us well over the last three years, as Dave could say, and either gets a check mark by the date or it doesn't. If a date needs to move for a good reason, different different story. Uh, we don't want to do the wrong thing on time, but uh, so but we'll keep coming back to this. And Sal's got like three page list here of things he's going to be tracking and reviewing with us. And these are the high level tasks distilled out of our, our scope. And uh, the first grouping really is what I described as time on the ground, pulling together data pulling together relevant studies, doing all that background review and research. And essentially, at the end of that process, we'll have a, a, a meeting that corresponds with, with that, roughly that day, um, we'll present sort of a summary of here's kind of findings and observations, which will include our observations and what we hear from, from this group as, as well about, you know, again, existing conditions, not to bore anybody with what we already know is out there, but basically to what do we extrapolate out of what's happening there today, and again, what needs to change, what needs to be preserved, what needs to be enhanced. Um, so that goes through the first week of April, and then um, that'll feed into the shred because then we'll have sort of that common ground of, okay, we have an understanding of the study area. Now the shred can be productive as we talk about where we want to go next. Hey, Sal. Or help me out here. It, it, it see, I know I must be wrong, 
But it seems to me, if it were me organizing this entire effort, I would have assumed the transportation is the first thing. If we have a failed intersection, you got to have a road. You have to have roads in here. And essentially, the leftover space is land. And the second phase is land use. I'm only telling you what little I know about this business. But that's not what we're doing. Right. So I'll give you my perspective. I know Philip will have his. Um, so I'm a land planner. Grew up in the land planning business last 30 years. And uh, grew up in a world where you did land planning, you hand it to a transportation guy, or the transportation, the transportation, they hand it to the land planning guy. And they really weren't talking to each other. Um, been with Kimley Horn for 15 years, and for the first time was introduced to how planning and transportation actually work hand in hand together. And what I've learned is it is totally an iterative back and forth process. Um, we have seen transportation projects that approached it as a transportation solution, and it may have worked functionally for transportation, but then other things didn't work. So, for example, every time you put a line on paper or build a road, you are creating a real estate challenge or opportunity. And, and sometimes putting the road in the wrong place barely on a piece of map can make a piece of property more or less developable. Um, in the day and age that now as we understand access, you know, there used to be a time where we just land planned everything and just said, you know, well, they're going to give me a driveway. Even if that driveway is 30 feet from the next driveway or the next intersection. We don't do that anymore, which is the right approach. But the point is, is that it's always back and forth and iterative. So the other thing we noticed is that, you know, from a zoning standpoint, for years we did zoning maps. And zoning implies that there's a certain amount of development intensity and density that can occur. Well, it has an impact on transportation systems. Mm -hmm. So for years what happened is we land planned and we started to develop, and then someone said, well, wait, we got a problem here because that road doesn't have the capacity to handle what you just developed. But the zoning would have permitted all of that development. So it just became sort of, you know, we, we you know, DOTs over the years have grown, the land planning community has grown to understand it's totally <coughs> iterative back and forth. I almost don't even look at it at who's going first because I know in our company, it's always going forward together. I never go to a development meeting without my transportation people, and they rarely go without me. It's, it's that interconnected. So it's sort of a chicken before the egg. But well, for, for a whole lot of years, we did it just the way you, you said, Vito. And more often than not, what we learned was while we were solving one problem, we were creating others that we left for other people to clean up. And uh, in some cases, in some cases, in some situations, depending on the context, you can put the transportation first in a, lo in a local area where you had this major arterial that's going through your business district, the land use piece is, is very important. Uh, and here we had an opportunity to, I, I think, do it do it the best way, which said, regardless of how you might think about it, let's look at the land use piece first, so that we make sure the transportation piece, to the extent practical, is responding to to the land use. Uh, you you can have a lot of discussions over beverages on on this point but um, I, I think I think the right the right sequence while it is iter iterative something has to st start the ball rolling and I think here the right thing is uh, to start with the land use piece and then quickly fold into transportation so that discussion goes goes back and forth even though it's for this small area you know, this isn't the Lynchburg to D.C. solution. This is, uh, let's take a look at the MPO ask. Let's take a look at this hydraulic area. What's the land use? What do we think it might be in the future? And what transportation solution best responds to that? Thank you. So we've got it in the right order, I think. I would like to expand on that in this particular area. Based on the land use, proposals that have been put forth in the past, it's likely that the uses that are 
proposed, if they ever come to fruition, that would be sort of east of 29, are going to limit the traffic that's going to cross 29 or want to go north on 29. So that the land use issues may dictate what the traffic counts are going to be at that intersection. And I think the other thing that I mentioned at the last meeting, and unfortunately I don't think we're going to have all the information we need in the time frame that we need, and this is maybe to Joel, we got a lot of stuff going on that's impacting Hydraulic Road and 29 traffic at this point. We've got the Best Buy ramp that's been in. Uh, we're going to have the Burkmore extension that's going to be in. We're going to have the three-laning of uh, the safety of 29 North. But the most important piece is Hillsdale. We're going to have 10 or 12,000 cars a day. They're going to come off that intersection once Hillsdale gets in. And then the other thing that it's hard to it's hard to put a number on, but I can tell you from sales reports I can see, Wegmans has had a significant impact on the traffic at that intersection. Yeah. There are a lot of people that were south of town that were coming up hydraulic, crossing hydraulic to do their shopping. They aren't doing that anymore. They're going to Fifth Street. So it seems to me that the combination of land use planning, uh, which can be looked at sort of in a utopian standpoint, from my perspective at this point, and the results of all these new traffic improvements and traffic studies uh, need to be known, uh, need to be done. That's the question. In terms of uh, our preparation for participating in the charrette, and I'm trying to think of how much kind of ahead of time homework to do. I'm not familiar with every county plan. I'm not familiar with every city plan, but we'll, there'll be a part of the charrette that gives us a five minute kind of summary of current thoughts, either what's in the county's comprehensive plan for this area or what's in the city's comprehensive plan for this area, or are we starting from that was all back then and now we're, we're fresh look ahead. I don't know if that no, I think it's a great idea. idea. Um, I might suggest it as homework, but it, I think as part of the shred, I'm going to make a note that maybe that's just a, a really good quick overview to do at the beginning yep. to give us all some common ground. So. And it may not be, and, and in that same vein, it may not be as easy to gather, uh, but the, the recent trends, I know population in the city has mm -hmm. grown, population in the county has grown, right. jobs I think basically the same. I just don't know exactly how they relate and what the attitudes toward either group would be toward finding some so relief I, for either of those trends. I think you could touch base with economic development in both the city yeah. and the county yeah. and nail that yeah. pretty, pretty quick. And then it's their information, right. not something we exactly. interpreted as your yeah, information. Sure. But I think it's a high level kind of TO. Or the chain idea. Thank you. Good, thank you. But if you think of a reading list beforehand that we need to touch on too. And, and I think Chip and I have talked about something, so I think we'll, um, we'll we'll absolutely do that. So I'll send out I'll send out an abstract for the the event, so you you know kind of what activities are going to occur, and maybe we'll include that reading list and uh, kind well, of. Let's chat about that on Monday too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, just this is again looking through the whole process, of sort of the end game. Uh, or maybe I shouldn't say end game, but getting towards the... Again, Talk the, about the dates for the public meetings back on the... We are targeting two dates now. Um, we have two public meetings in, in the scope. Um, April 26th and August 23rd uh, are the target dates right now. Um, April 26th would be the meeting where we basically are looking for public input. We're not presenting ideas, plans to, re, to be reacted to. It's more, again, of an open dialogue, open discussion uh, with the public. The August 23rd date would be where we actually would have concepts to put before the public and get, and get feedback and, and reaction to. Um, so we may, you know, we could slide around the August 23rd. Again, this is, the schedule's pretty tight, moving pretty quick. So we want to target these. We have to notify, uh, notice them, obviously, you know, ahead of the meetings. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of look at how things, how things flow. But that right now on the schedule looks like the two days we'd like to like to settle on and share. As we talked uh, the first the first time we met, these are the two meetings that that uh, Sal is scoped to kind of organize and present information. At there's a desire to have more meetings in the city and the county with planning 
commissions, uh, we can we'll, we'll figure that we'll figure that out. Uh, Want to also point out that these will not be VDOT public meetings. They're your public meetings, so we'll need to work with the city and the county to make sure we give the notice in the way those localities would want uh, want the notice to be to be issued. We don't want to advertise these as, as VDOT because they're not. Uh, and the other task, you know, this this kind of gets to these two points here that we have. We'll have more than two inputs, external transportation, but that's the idea that we do that loop. We have some development of plans, external transportation inputs, um, and uh, from Paul's group, and then we screen some concepts, and then we go back to external transportation after they've had you know, some time to look at potential systems and, and changes to the system, they come back, and, and that's that iterative loop that I've talked about. Um, and then we'll get to a preferred concept development, which will come, which will come through this group. And then again, the core area plan will sort of come on the on the end as an illustrative of sort of bringing together everything we've talked about to show what it could look like if we accomplish uh, all of our priorities. And then we we have the planning commission uh, presentations uh, sometime in September. Uh, dates to be determined, and um, we'll go through a draft similarity plan process, which you'll be able to review, and then we'll finalize that plan. The project abstract uh, will bring forward some examples over the next several weeks with you. Um, that's sort of that collateral marketing piece where you can lay it on the desk and someone can pick it up and get that quick read of, of that process and the results of this process um, without reading through the through the whole study and the report. So very graphic, uh, illustrative summary of, of the overall small area plan. As Paul Perdue and Dave work out, Dave Covington work out the scope for phase two for the transportation piece, we'll start sliding those key milestones in here so we'll get a better picture of how it all fits together and how that transportation piece veto is coming coming into into this work. So for Sal covered a, a lot of ground. I think the most important thing we did there was nail down uh, April 11th from 8.30 to 12.30. And I really appreciate you all being willing to do that. That's given a lot of your time. And uh, we'll make sure it's, it's productive. Does that mean if we don't meet that Thursday? Pardon me? We have a normal schedule. Yeah, we would not meet. Okay. Yeah, 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 we won't. That would be in lieu of our 2 o'clock meeting. We'll have the charrette from 8.30 to 12.30. And we'll get that uh, posted on the website, get that information uh, out, and, uh, out and about. I guess that's three weeks, three weeks from today, I think. Um, I will be talking, Chip, Sal, and Dave and I are talking every Monday morning at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll go over some of the discussions we have, particularly about the background information. I, I think that's a good idea, and I think we either should give you some abstracts or at least give you some links where you can go do, do, some, do some homework. But I, I believe we could uh, take advantage, Sal, of some existing information, we don't need to rewrite it. Uh, we can get it get it to you. Uh, I think the trends are a good idea. Whether we get that from city and the county or from our from our friends at the chamber, there ought to be some good information there. Not overload, but that we can give you for some some background information. Uh, you know, it's a Information and data, it, there are endless sources. The, the key is to get, get some knowledge from it all, and that's always always the trick. But we'll 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 do that. Sal, thanks thanks a lot. Um, this is the spot where, if you have any open discussion or anything you want for a future agenda item, the only thing I would say here is that it won't be April the 11th. It would be April the whatever that next day is. 27th, I think. Is that right? April yeah. the 11th? <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's right. We're not meeting on Thursday. April the 11th is Tuesday. That's right. 
I better which, check this room, Chip. Which means no, that'll work. Out. That'll work. <laughs> which also means we're not meeting before the first public meeting. That's April 26th. It's April 26th is the way it's scheduled now. That doesn't bother me. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. So I think it's almost... I think it's almost uh, maybe some advantage. Yeah. 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 Then, okay. uh, right. So, yeah, Tuesday, April the 11th, not April the 13th. So, Tuesday, April the 11th, then we'll get reminders out on, on all that. Excellent. But uh, for, for our next regular meeting on April the 27th, if there are any thoughts you have now about anything you want to see, discuss then. This is a chance to do it or to wrap up anything from this meeting. Chip? Go ahead. Morgan? I thought Kurt's suggestion for having that background material would be really helpful just to help get us all on the same page. Are we thinking at this point that would just be limited to the land use plans or would it also be helpful to have a little bit of the transportation components involved in that as well? Let, let me talk with Chip and Sal and Dave there a little bit and think through it because I it could be useful just to provide, I'm not saying every detail of the transportation plans, but just to provide some of the context for the background mm -hmm. where we are now. Someone with the land use doesn't mean it's written in stone, but just having that context of where we are now may be useful. Okay. Okay. We'll get a good balance there. Great. Vita? Okay, thank you. Um, just carving out some time on the 27th to debrief about the 26th. Right, right. Mark? Alex? Kurt? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Chuck? I'm going to bring up something tangentially that I think is pretty important to the implementation of whatever this group comes up with. <clears throat> Kathy's trying in the city. Ninth is trying in the county. But within these small areas, we really need to sort of encourage the public sector to recognize that there needs to be expedited approval processes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, what's being proposed, particularly from a redevelopment standpoint, where you've got old ordinances, you've got new ordinances. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to speak for others who are in the table do what we do, but it'd be almost impossible if we don't have a strategic investment area type mm -hmm. overlay for the areas that are going to be covered under these small area mm -hmm. plans. Yes, yeah. we concur. Yeah. Now, I don't, don't this is not necessarily a plug for form based zoning, but it is but a code. But, but it does mean, though, that yeah. into yeah. the zoning, it needs to have some, it has to reflect the community's values in terms of how things get built out. But once it's proved that we can't be, um, Having two year, three year review process. That's, that's my point. Okay. Good point. Thank you, Chuck. Dale? Did your wireless connection work? Uh, didn't need it. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Alan? No, nope. I'll go to screen. Okay. Look, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. So, Tuesday, April the 11th, we'll see you here at, we'll get started at 8 30. So, we'll see you a little bit before 8 30. And we'll have some uh, nibbles. <laughs> okay, thank you. Remember, I hang a right at the bottom of the road. Coffee is really the key. Stay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Peace out, guys. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Okay.